Well, good morning, everyone, uh, or good afternoon, depending on what part of Canada you are joining us from today. Um, my name is Laura Jones, and I'm the Executive Vice President at CFIB, which is just a fancy way of saying I um, do a lot of uh, different things, wear a lot of different hats, like many of you and your businesses. And one of my favorite hats to wear is webinar um, host. And today we are returning to our Maximizing Your Membership series. So this is the series where we bring you relevant practical information on the topics that most affect your business. And today we're really excited to do one on cybercrime um, and obviously a very relevant uh, topic. And we've got some great guests uh, today from the RCMP, from Homeland Security. We have a vice president from MasterCard. And uh, while I'm doing some introductions, a, a uh, 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 shout out to MasterCard for their great support of our work in this area. You'll hear a little bit more about that in a moment, but they've been a terrific partner. There are lots of people working in this space um, because everyone is really affected by um, by cyber, cyber crime, cyber security. So it's a, a big um, something we all need to be worried about. And MasterCard has been a great partner helping deliver some fantastic content, including um, today's webinar. So just a couple of housekeeping notes um, before I introduce our presenters. And so the first one is at the bottom of your screen, you will see there's a Q&A and a chat function. So the chat will leave both of those open. The chat is uh, for uh, people to uh, talk to each other and uh, other, other participants and just make comments. The questions are if you have something specific that you'd like the presenters to address or answer. And so we'll be monitoring mainly the Q&A lane. We take a look at the chat lane uh, as well sometimes. But if you do have a question for the presenter, the question and answer lane is the one that you uh, want and type in your question. You can upvote them too, and we'll try and get to the most uh, relevant and pressing questions, as many of them as we can. We like to answer on, our, on the webinars. We also have uh, some of you submit some questions in advance, so we're going to try and hit um, some of those as well. Um, and while I am introducing the presenters, uh, feel free to introduce yourselves to each other in the chat lane if you want to put what part of the country you're joining us from. That never gets old for me, um, as our regulars know. Uh, we've got a great community, and you'll see that there'll, there'll be people from coast to coast um, on, on here. So see, we've got Stony Creek, Ontario. We've got Langley, BC. I just love how diverse our membership is, and it gives our presenters a good sense of um, where you're all coming to us from. I'm going to just do a brief uh, round of introductions um, here with uh, uh, Jocelyn is with us. And so Jocelyn's put on her camera and uh, given a quick uh, wave. Um, e. Dan, um, who's with the RCMP and the National Cyber Crime, Cyber Crime Coordination Center is with us. E. Dan, so great to have you in the house. We've got um, Homeland Security in the house. So that's uh, that's pretty impressive. So you can see how much cross-border coordination and collaboration there is. Jason's with us. And then, as I mentioned, Gina, who's been a great partner for MasterCard, um, helping us bring you some terrific um, content. So um, let's get to it because we've got we've got a packed agenda today. Um, we're going to just do a really quick review of CFIB and um, MasterCard tools on prevention. We recently, in partnership with MasterCard, um, introduced a cybersecurity academy, which is a fancy way of saying some really easy, quick, um, great courses that you and your um, employees can take on preventing um, cyber crime. So those are really great uh, classes and we thought it's really relevant to what we're talking about today. So just a really quick overview of that. And MasterCard has some other great resources in their trust center. And I think there's a slide on that in the appendix. So if anyone wants to check out um, some of their resources, um, they're there as well. Then we're going to get to the key part of our presentation, which is you're going to hear from the RCMP and Homeland Security on cybercrime uh, prevention. And then we um, take as many of your questions. We're pretty casual on these webinars, so we'll take them as we go. Um, but then we'll try and leave some time at the end as well. A couple of other quick things I just want to mention in terms of the content. We will send you this deck after the um, in an email after the uh, after the webinar is over, you'll also get a link to this webinar. And we thought it would be relevant to send you a link to a webinar we did on cybersecurity. Um, so this one focuses mainly on cybercrime, but the other one on cybersecurity, I think, is relevant, too. So you will get all of that. 
Um, there are a, there's one tool that we're going to present where you have to log into your um, uh, with your membership number to get that tool. It's a, a template, and Jocelyn will talk about that in a minute. But most of the content we will just send you in your in the email, and I believe Alexis probably also posted the um, uh, today's uh, deck in the chat if you want to um, access it that way. Okay. Before we get going, we always like to have a little bit of humor, um, just because, you know, these topics are so serious. Um, but you know that the first one is really the idea of, you know, putting your head in the sand around this, which is not a great idea. But I think um, it's it's not where this group is at because you're coming to this webinar. But of course, there is a lot of like cybersecurity. Am I too small for that? Does that affect me? Do I have to worry about that? And the answer, unfortunately, is yes, we all have to worry about it. And um, and big companies and small companies are recognizing that, you know, cybersecurity really needs kind of a, a seat at the table. Uh, so um, anyway, hopefully those made you laugh and put a smile on your face. And with that, that, I'm going to introduce my, bring up my co-host, Jocelyn. Many of you have met her before. She's one of our terrific um, team of, of people who are on our regularly answering the phones and taking your calls. And Jocelyn, you're going to walk people through just a little bit quickly about what we've done in the cybersecurity space before we introduce our cyber crime guests. And I'm going to turn this over to you. Thank you, Laura. Welcome, everyone. Um, you know, as Laura mentioned, cybersecurity is a critical issue for small businesses, and we wanted to make sure that you got the right information to protect your business. Except CFID, we're not actually cybersecurity experts, so we needed to find a partner that was. And luckily for us, that expertise came from MasterCard. And I'm actually going to ask our special guest, Gina, um, who's our MasterCard uh, Vice President of Product Management, Cyber and Intelligence, to actually explain how MasterCard fits in with cybersecurity protection. Hi, Gina. Hey, Jocelyn. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you, Laura, for the introduction. So. MasterCard is actually a technology company. People often think of us as that MasterCard credit card in their wallet, or merchants think of us as that point of sale terminal. But we are a technology company that is dedicated to making payments simpler, smarter, and safety, safely. So we are hyper-focused on cybersecurity because we know that without security, there is no trust in the in payments or commerce. So that's why we are involved. Um, I'm the global owner of the MasterCard Trust Center. It provides free cybersecurity web education, resources, and tools, all designed to help you and your employees as small businesses and medium-sized businesses secure your digital ecosystem. And you can find the Trust Center by searching MasterCard Trust Center Canada to learn more about how to secure your business. So MasterCard became a partner with CFIB because both of our organizations are concerned about the, the health the, and the ability to thrive and grow of small and medium sized businesses. And we bring that um, cybersecurity side of it. So uh, that's where we fit into this, um, this puzzle. Thank you, yeah. Jocelyn. So with MasterCard, um, we actually created CFIB's Cybersecurity Academy, which is a fancy way of saying that we created some quick, plain language cybersecurity courses directed specifically to you and your employees. We currently have six courses available, and there's two more coming before the summer of 2023. And included in those courses, we have templates valued at over $5,500. And we're going to talk about a few of those templates today. You can find those courses and all of the templates in your CFIB member portal. So you just have to go to our website, cfib.ca, and log in. And I do want to point out that we have a contest running until March 31st. For each cybersecurity course that a learner completes, so that's either you or an, even your employees, that learner gets a ballot into a draw. The grand prize is $10,000. And there's also regional prizes of $500 to be won. 
And we're very pleased to tell you that so far there's been thousands of cybersecurity courses completed. So don't miss out on this great opportunity. And then the next slide we're actually going to talk about is we know that some of you um, have been longtime attendees of these webinars. And if you recall, um, back in March of 2022, Gina and uh, myself and Laura and some of our colleagues, we did a webinar. Um, as Laura mentioned, we are going to be sharing a recording of that webinar in today's follow up email. So you're going to get the deck from today, recording of last year's webinar and this year's webinar. And we wanted to recap some of the things because that webinar was about things that you can immediately do to protect your business. You can see that 60% of small businesses permanently close after a major cybersecurity incident. And we thought that Gina could review some of the key takeaways from that first webinar. Gina? Thank you. Um, so one of the things I talk about in that webinar is that 95% of cyber breaches are caused by human error. I call that good news because human error can be corrected by learning about cybersecurity best practices, learning about cyber risks, and taking actions to improve security. So three of the important actions that you can take include educate yourself and your employees on cybersecurity best practices by completing the CFIB Cyber Academy that was just talked about. You simply log into the, um, your CFIB member panel and then you start the academy. And as it was mentioned, the lessons within each of the courses you can complete quickly. I've completed everything. It's incredible the amount of information that you can get from that to help secure your business. So I'll talk about four of the top ways that you can reduce the vulnerabilities of your business. Number one, passwords. Your passwords are the key to everything that you don't want other people to see. So make them safe, make them complex. Don't just put password or one, two, three, or your name. You make them complex. Also, don't reuse passwords on multiple accounts because if a hacker gets one of those, they can go into other accounts. Um, don't share passwords with others and use two-factor authentication. Another important thing that you should do is update, install um, software updates. And that's where you, know, you get a pop-up on your phone or whatever, or um, on software that says, you know, update, do it right away because cyber criminals, they know when those updates are coming out and they'll go in and look for businesses and individuals that haven't updated those software and they'll get in and attack. Also learn to recognize to avoid phishing scams. You've gotta be careful on what you click on with emails, with text messages. You've gotta be careful what you say in voice messages. And there's about 16 more ways that cyber or phishing attacks happen. And also do not use um, un unsecured USBs or thumb drives or, um, or let's see, uh, flash drives. Um, don't use those if you find one. Do not plug it in your computer to see if it's something that you can figure out who owns that because that's when malware can be added. Just destroy it, throw it away, destroy it so that no one else can get into that. And lastly, prepare in advance for a cyber breach. And this is what um, Jocelyn's going to talk about, CFIB's Cyber Incident Response Plan. So take it away, Jocelyn. Thank you, Gina. So if there's one thing that um, you can take away from this webinar, we would really like you to download our Cybersecurity Incident Response Plan. And if we look at the next slide, we have a little snapshot of what it looks like. The Cybersecurity Incident Response Plan, or the SERP as we call it, uh, is a templated business plan that is available for you to download and fill out. And it is to help you plan for uh, when, sadly not if, but when your business has an incident. Um, it is going to show you how to respond to an event, which will help you minimize your disruptions 
and there we go and it will help you respond to an event so minimize disruptions help you recover from the incident because it allows you to take the time to reflect of what happened during the incident as a result of the breach a SERP, as we call it, is important because it can help you secure better cybersecurity insurance. And I know many of you have asked questions about insurance, and we are going to touch at that at the end of the presentation. And um, the SERP report can also help you report incidents to law enforcement because it's going to give you a written account of all of the events and all of the steps that have been taken throughout the cyber attack. So with that said, it's time to turn the presentation over to our special guests. I'm going to invite uh, Idan and Jason up and um, they can talk to us about the role of um, law enforcement in cybersecurity. Take it away, guys. Thank you, Jocelyn. Um, you know, on, on behalf of, of Jason, myself, the RCMP and HSI, Thank you guys all for taking an interest in this. Um, thank you for coming and listening. Uh, today, we're going to talk a little bit about cybercrime, um, what, what it is, how it's impacting Canada, um, and how the NC3, so the National Cybercrime Coordination Center, and HSI uh, work together along with other partners all across Canada and internationally uh, to fight this, to fight cybercrime. To the next slide, please. So yeah, a little bit about, about who we are. Um, so my name is Idan Eskovic. I'm a strategic intelligence analyst from the RCMP's National Cybercrime Coordination Center. Uh, we're a national police service, and our goal is to essentially empower Canadian law enforcement or enable Canadian law enforcement to better address cybercrime, to reduce the threat, victimization, and impact on Canadians. Um, so we are there to support police in investigating cyber crimes and, and protecting businesses like yourselves um, in, the, in the case that you do get victimized. Um, Jason, do you, want, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. Good morning or good afternoon uh, or good evening, wherever you're from. Uh, my name is Jason Conboy. I'm a special agent criminal investigator with the United States Department of Homeland Security, Homeland Security Investigations, for short, we'll say HSI. I've been here for 18 months in Ottawa at the U.S. Embassy and part of our mandate as liaison officers posted internationally is to work cross-border investigations to include cybercrime along with our partners with the FBI and Secret Service and some other U.S. law enforcement agencies. And we work hand in hand with our partners in Canada, whether it's the RCMP, Ottawa Police, Provincial Police, uh, all across Canada to prevent and to work these types of cyber crimes together. Why are we here? <laughs> We're here to tell you a little bit about the threats that are facing businesses in Canada, how they might impact you, uh, and a little bit about what you should do uh, when you're impacted. But most importantly, we're here to tell you a little bit about how cybercrime is addressed by law enforcement and spoiler alert, it's addressed by collaborating with each other, by working together. Uh, it's truly a crime type where you cannot work alone, you cannot investigate it alone. So we are happy to have partners like Jason from HSI, others from FBI, um, and, and across the world uh, to, work, to work with to investigate cybercrime. Yeah, we focus a lot, too, on outreaches like this. Uh, the last thing you want is to meet uh, one of us, probably most likely the RCMP or your local police in Canada, after an incident. So doing these public outreaches and webinars, so you guys get a good law enforcement perspective on what we're doing and what we're seeing on the cybercrime aspect. And hop to the next slide. Yeah, so what's, what's going on with cybercrime in Canada? Well, unfortunately, uh, it's on the rise. There's been an upward trend in cyber criminal incidents since 2019. And actually, frankly, we don't necessarily have a lot of data, but it's been happening since before 2019. Um, in the first half of 2020, we already have a projected increase uh, of, by at least 2,000 incidents um, in 2022. Um, and we, we know that that number is probably low um, because not every cybercrime is reported to police. Um, and in fact, if we jump to the next slide, um, Statistics Canada estimates that between 10 and 12% of all cyber crimes uh, are reported to police. So if we are getting you know, uh, that small percentage, the, the problem is exponentially bigger. Um, there's been a ton of losses also with cyber-related cyber fraud. Um, so the CAFC in, 2020, in 2022 
found that $529 million uh, were lost to, to different kinds of fraud, 70% of which were cyber enabled. I mean, a lot of, of the stuff that we see right now or the biggest threat that we see right now uh, is ransomware. And so you'll see at the bottom there that number 512. So we've received in 2022, uh, 512 ransomware related requests for the, at the NC3. And that doesn't mean that only 512 businesses were impacted by ransomware. That's just who, who we were able to support in the investigations that were referred to us. A lot of those investigations were taken on by local police agencies and they never made it to our level. Um, but it just shows you the scale of these problems that a lot of folks are affected um, and, and everybody is the target. So you can hop over to the next slide too. Um, yeah, so we're facing a highly motivated adversary. They're unscrupulous and they adapt like no ad ad adversary that we've seen. Um, the message that I'm trying to send with all of these headlines is essentially that everyone and everything is a target for cyber criminals. You, the, everything that is the topic of the day, so you know, COVID, for example, um, or cryptocurrency, they will all use these kinds of lures to be able to victimize you. I know Jason has been involved in some uh, COVID notification stuff. So maybe I'll pass it along to you, Jason, to, to chat about the kind of targeting that you've seen, and then I'll, I'll finish off the slide. I wonder, Edan and Jason, before we get to that, um, there are a couple of questions. Well, there was one comment in the chat and, and a question from Sean that I think is, is directly relevant to what you just spoke about. And that is, you know, we talked about this a little bit in um, some of our preparation for this webinar, right? What do you do if you call your local, the RCMP um, or your police, and they don't have the skill, like they, they have, people are at different places with this, right? And even some police departments, they haven't caught up to where the world is. And so how, how do you get it escalated if you're trying to report? Or what advice do you have for people if they call the police and the police are kind of not sure what to do themselves? That's a, that's a great question. And that's kind of where the NC3 comes in. Um, so we'll talk about it a little bit later in the slides, but we're building a national reporting system for folks to report nationally. If their police force won't take the report or can't take the report, doesn't have the capacity, doesn't have the investigative capacity, whatever the reason might be, um, we wanna make sure that there is a streamlined place for folks to report cyber crimes to police. Right now, the, the way to do that is through the Canadian Anti-Fraud Center, who is actually our sister organization because fraud and cyber crime are, are intrinsically linked. Um, but we're rolling out hopefully later in 2023 or early 2024, um, what's called the National Cyber Crime and Fraud Reporting System, so that folks like you have an opportunity to report those cyber crimes in the cases where maybe you can't get help or the, the police of jurisdiction in your area uh, doesn't have the capacity to help you. Sounds like a great initiative and one that we are going to um, make sure, um, Sean, and for those other members that have the same question, we'll be making sure that we have those as that progresses, that we're getting you that information and all of those tools. And as you said, Edan, you're going to touch on it a little bit later in the presentation as well. So I'll let you get back to your regularly scheduled program here. No problem. That was, that was a, a great uh, uh, intervention of information there. I think we left off just talking a little bit about um, how we in law enforcement are constantly catching up to the criminals because they don't have policy and budgets and rules and things that we have to deal with. Uh, they share all of their uh, ways, you know, their, their trades and tactics and practices. And uh, when I was at cyber headquarters before Ottawa, we saw this firsthand in uh, COVID. It, it would begin with websites that were dropping malicious um, malware onto people's devices. They were selling hand sanitizers and paper towels and then never sending the product. As the vaccines came online, they started COVID vaccine fraud. And then when there was the government relief to the citizens of the United States for COVID funds, there were COVID fraud as well for financial. So the criminals are constantly adapting. And I think it's, uh, talking about the websites getting set up, I'm going to kind of answer a question in the middle of this. Somebody, uh, Mike asked about a spoof domain mimicking a domain to try to steal payments. Uh, I had kind of firsthand for many, many months over a year dealing with these fraudulent websites. And I would reach out to those domain registrars that are hosting the websites. So when somebody buys a website, say from GoDaddy or Two Cows in Canada, there's usually an abuse link that you can email and let them know, this is not our site. We've had our lawyers uh, review it. Um, they're probably conducting some sort of fraud scheme, would you would you mind taking a look at it? And usually those companies will try to do their best to take those sites down. And then obviously, as Edan will 
We'll talk about the rest of it. You want to report that to law enforcement so maybe they can try to investigate that criminal organization. Yeah, definitely. And I mean, I think a perfect, those are some examples of, of cyber criminals being indiscriminate in their targeting. They will target the most vulnerable parts of our, of our society to be able to, to make a quick buck. If a cyber criminal believes they can make money off, off you, they will try. It doesn't matter if you're a critical infrastructure provider a health, like a healthcare entity or an educational institution or the, the, a small, small mom and pop shop. Um, th if they believe that you have data that they're interested in, if they believe that they can make money off of your business, they're, they're going to try to. So if your company is essentially internet connected, you are a potential target, uh, no matter how small. And this can be all different kinds of cybercrime. Uh, we're going to talk a lot about ransomware today because that's what's most reported to police. Um, but like Jason said, this can be frauds like uh, non-delivery fraud, where you're ordering something and it doesn't actually arrive, um, or they may just be stealing information from you to, to resell and re-victimize you later on. I think we can uh, hop to the next slide, please. Yeah, so here we talk a little bit about sort of ransomware incidents by sector. Um, you'll notice that the most targeted sector is the services sector. Um, and it is, I, I regret to inform you that the services sector is largely composed of small and medium businesses. Um, so the rest of these sectors are more of the critical infrastructure pieces. Um, they're usually large businesses for the most part. Um, but this services sector is all the small and medium businesses that provide services to, to society every day. That's, you know, your um, consulting consultancies, your mechanic that's around the corner, your corner store, um, so on and so forth. Um, so they are being targeted and, and we see it in the data right away that, that they are being targeted. Um, I think we can we'll move on from this slide now. Yeah. And so a lot of that targeting is ransomware. And so, as I said, ransomware is the most disruptive threat uh, to Canadian businesses right now. They're growing in sophistication uh, and they've impacted all industries, including government, including uh, supply chain, IT providers, small and medium businesses, critical infrastructure. As our world becomes more digitally connected, the risks of these kinds of disruptions only increase because the attack surface for these folks increase. There's more points of entry for them. Um, this is you know, not just a US problem where we see Kaseya, a US company getting hit. Uh, it's a Canadian problem too. Um, and these ransomware operators, they operate like businesses. They have names, associated reputations. Um, the NC3, HSI, FBI, law enforcement all across the world are trying to track, identify, and disrupt and arrest the most prolific groups in this space. Um, and we do so by trying to concentrate our efforts uh, and come back combating the most impactful groups. They target companies who can't tolerate downtime, who have sensitive data that they don't want publicly released. And that's because they use multiple avenues to extort you. So not only will they lock down your systems and steal your data, but they will then extort you and threaten to release your data publicly, or they'll threaten to reach out to your customer uh, and say, hey, put pressure on that business to uh, put pressure on that business to pay the ransom or we will leak your data or we will, we, or we will leak the, the broader data set. Um, I think here it's important to note that law enforcement has had some, some significant successes, especially lately. Uh, we've disrupted prolific groups. Uh, one called Hive was recently disrupted in, in collaboration with the FBI, with HSI, with Europol, um, and we targeted their infrastructure. And other international collaborations has resulted in the arrest and disruption of other really, really prolific groups. Yeah, we want to uh, touch on as well the trend that we've seen over the years going from, you know, a small ransomware actor, maybe trying to extort two to three thousand dollars. And over the years, it's gone to like that big game hunting. And as you Don talked about, almost like that cartel style organized crime. So they can hit multiple targets uh, all the time. And they're just hoping that somebody will pay. And I'm sure some of you are, are, are thinking of asking, should we pay? Um, you know, you have to get your businesses back online. But of course, all of us in, in law enforcement don't recommend that. There's a lot of things that can come out of it. Number one, you you know, the criminals are getting paid to facilitate more of their infrastructure and pay their coders and all their other criminals within their, their group, their extortion group. And then you've got... Um, the problem that will they even give you the proper decryptor? And then even if they do, because it's probably bad for business, if they give you a, a faulty decryptor, they still have access to your data. Um, there's that commercial where they say, all your internet's on the dark web. I've, I've operated on the dark web for a long time. So does the RCMP and a lot of us in, in online investigations. And we see 
businesses' personal information and trade secrets for sale online. So there's no guarantee that even though you get the decryptor, they're going to post it on and, and sell that data because data is valuable to these organizations. And then lastly, uh, which is the sad thing, is then you're kind of now a known victim that will pay. So it could kind of open up for another organization to come in and, and attack your business because there's been previous payments in the past. Now, I'm sure you're all asking, who are these people? Who are these cyber criminals? And why are they targeting me? Uh, well, they cyber criminals have a, a wide range of motivation. Uh, and in terms of what we see at the NC3, it's a lot of, of financial, financially motivated cyber crime. Um, but they, are, they have lots of different motivations that come from all walks of life. It can be anything from a kid in their parents' basement uh, to a highly skilled and highly funded uh, state-backed group or anything in between, really. And much like any other industry, there's lots of jobs to be filled in the cyber criminal industry and in the cyber criminal ecosystem. Uh, so conducting a successful ransomware attack actually requires coordination between these different roles. And you'll see I've listed some of the roles down below uh, and I'll go through them. So a typical ransomware attack conducted by one of the major sophisticated groups can include folks doing one or many of these roles um, and then together they result in, in the impact that you see on your business. So the first one that says IAB, there's an initial access broker. This is the cyber criminal that gains access to your network uh, and then sells it to other cyber criminals. So often that access can be gained through phishing, um, compromised credentials. There's mul uh, existing vulnerabilities. There's a multitude of ways for, for actors to get into your businesses, unfortunately. That access then gets sold or it can be the same person uh, to an affiliate. And that affiliate procures that access and they sometimes sometimes they themselves gain access but they're the ones that partner with the ransomware group to deploy the ransomware on your system and to compromise the system of a target they then either encrypt your system right away or they'll exfiltrate data and encrypt your system or just exfiltrate data and they store it securely for a potential future release from there they go to the negotiation process uh, and they will negotiate with you and try to convince you that the only feasible option for you right now is to pay the ransom. After that ransom is paid, uh, they then have either that same person or someone else is their money manager or money launderer um, and the proceeds of crime then get laundered. Uh, right now, a lot of what we're seeing is these, these proceeds of crime are getting laundered through cryptocurrency. And this is a key part of the process because this ensures that all the parts of this chain get paid and it validates that business model so they can do it again and again and again. Yeah, it's a good point. On uh, Nancy asked a question about is uh, the use of crypto to move illicit proceeds and the rise of ransomware. Obviously, it's a challenge for us in law enforcement, but we're always just trying to get a step ahead of them. We can trace crypto. We information share, work together, and work with our um, you know our crown up here in Canada or prosecutors in the U.S. to seize those illicit proceeds. Um, I believe touching on a little bit of the ransomware as a service and cybercrime as a service is probably. Uh, the rise in uh, ransomware as well, because it's really easy now to do these uh, things as Idan just explained how a ransomware group is organized. And there's another question as well about how cyber criminals make contact with your company. It's a Monday morning, you open up your computer network and you've got that uh, ransomware letter, which I think we have that in a few slides coming up. Usually the threat actor, the extortionist then will direct the victim to some sort of secure um, dark net site or telegram or some kind of end to end encrypt it to have those conversations um, about payment and releasing the files. Good to the next slide. Yeah, so uh, a big a big part of the proliferation of ransomware has and finding folks to fill these distinct roles has been the development of, of what we call a cybercrime as a service business model. So I think many of you might be familiar with the software as a service business model, um, and this is fundamentally what cyber criminals have gone to. And unfortunately, it's not difficult to come by. Uh, because of the profitability of, of ransomware in particular, the cybercrime ecosystem has continuously grown, um, and this business model actually lowers the risk of, or lowers the technical skills required to conduct cybercrime. Um, this kind of these kinds of skills uh, can be procured or sold through the dark dark web marketplaces and hacker forums. Um, and for those of you who are not familiar with the dark web, the dark web is an unindexed part of the internet. Um, so there's a bunch of websites and domains that uh, comprise the dark web that don't show up on Google. They require a special software that anonymizes your connection to visit. 
Um, there are openly shared lists of what are called onion sites. Um, so those are, that's the, those are the dark web websites, um, but others are not so openly shared. And some of these communities are open to anyone, but others are closed and require invitations or, or special connections to access. Um, and a lot of these available offerings that I talk about on the right, or that's listed on the right here, such as botnet services, distributed denial of service, uh, phishing services, initial access brokers, um, bulletproof hosting, criminal VPN, so on and so forth. You know, you guys can read them yourselves. Um, they are all offered on these, on these platforms. Not only are illegitimate things offered on these platforms, but there's also uh, legitimate commercial hacking tools where cracked copies are offered on these platforms as well. So in addition to working with the illegitimate tools that exist, these hackers are also working with legitimate tools that are being repurposed to, for their own needs. And so they, once again, these actors will take any edge that they can get in order to flip something on its head, in order to make a little bit of money, in order to misuse a tool. So why are you being victimized? What should you do? Well, we're the police, so we obviously encourage you to, to report to your police. The first step is reporting to your local police. And it's really important to report to your local police because it makes police aware of this growing problem, not just nationally, but in their jurisdiction. Reporting is a key part of the puzzle because without reporting, police can't go out and investigate willy-nilly anybody. We need somebody to report to us that there's a, there's a crime that has occurred um, and we will investigate who might be responsible for this activity. Like I said earlier, if there are some cases where local police have limited capacity and they might not be able to take your report, in those cases, uh, the, you can report it online to the CAFC and soon we will have the NCFRS up and running. Um, the NC3 is actively working to make the reporting process less of a burden on the victim um, through our new reporting system. We have opportunities for businesses to get involved in the development of this. Um, and uh, I think Jen will put a, a link in the chat for those who are interested. They can reach out and help us do some testing and make sure that our system works well for you. Now, what will police do and why does it help? Police will follow any leads in your case and will deconflict with other police agencies across the country because often folks who do this kind of crime, uh, they will, there will be somebody sitting, let's say in the US using a server in Japan, uh, laundering the funds through Thailand, victimizing somebody in Canada. So it can go across the globe many times over. Um, and it's important that these we work together with folks like Jason, folks all across the world uh, to be able to combat this. We are acutely aware that your first priority as a victim is to get your systems up and running. And we do not wanna be a part of, of stopping that. We wanna work in parallel with your recovery efforts. We wanna make sure we can work in parallel with a third party recovery company. If you hire one, we can work together with the folks that, that are working on it internal to your business. Our goal is not to waltz in and seize all your systems. I think that's a common misconception. We make every effort to cause as little disruption as possible. We'll need any information that you can share. This includes copies of communication um, that can be uh, copies of communication with a cyber criminal, rather um, any indicators of compromise. So IP addresses, uh, logs, um, any artifacts that you might have on your system that, that would be important to us. Any forensic reports that have been uh, generated um, or really anything that you think might be relevant to us, uh, better understanding who this, who might be doing this kind of activity. Um, and I'll also underscore uh, in terms of answering this, should we pay? Um, I'll echo what, what Jason was saying is, you know, law enforcement and the government of Canada, they, we don't recommend paying the ransom of cyber criminals. Um, you are essentially putting your trust in these criminals. And I'll say that there is no guarantee that they'll keep their word. Uh, the NC3 has seen many instances of a victim paying and then being re-extorted um, or access being resold. Um, we've seen instances where we've seized a server and we've seen uh, the, the victim's data who's already paid still on that server. So by putting the, this trust in these cyber criminals, you're essentially giving them the opportunity to re-extort you and potentially putting a target on your back, like Jason said. I think this is a good time to pause to just um, ask you guys a couple of questions because there are um, so many that have piled in. I mean, first of all, you've got some examples here on, on the screen and 
Um, I know we had a couple of questions and you answered it earlier in terms of what it would look like, but um, Paslo is asking, do they leave contact information on your screen? Um, do they telephone first? Um, do they ask for the person in charge? So is, is a message like the ones you've kind of showing here, is that typical in what you would expect? Or are there other ways that this would come? Like, what does this feel like when you're on the other side of it would be the first question. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it definitely doesn't feel good. I mean, um, you, you can Google ransomware negotiations. There's a couple of cybersecurity sites that have posted how these conversations happen. Some of these threat actors um, act like they're trying to help you, like their customer service. And you kind of realize that, no, you're not. You're a cyber extortionist. You're a criminal. Um, they leave their contact info and just looking at this screenshot, ProtonMail is encrypted, Tutano is also as well. So they will always use some sort of end-to-end -end encrypted um, communications platform. And this is why getting those indicators of compromise, like Idan was saying, on intrusion response is key because maybe we find a flaw in their operational security, their OPSEC, or like this Bitcoin wallet, maybe they've used this multiple times with multiple victims and we can use our experts on both sides of the border to trace this crypto and try to find some attribution. I just want to follow up on that because I know in some of the practice webinars when we were together, one of the things that I can't remember whether it was you, Jason, or you, Idan, who said, but you know, like how powerful it is to get small businesses reporting because you know, for every one big business hit, there might be 10 small businesses, but you really like getting those 10 small businesses helps you find the mistakes that the that the criminals are making. So that reporting and how important it is. And one thing just about given that some of the local policing is still catching up, I also just want to underscore your point that even if they don't know what to do, hearing that this is a problem that they should be on and you making that phone call isn't a waste of time um, because it does put it on the radar screen. I just want to um, come in behind that. And then my final, I'm grouping a few things here together, but I noticed that Genevieve put in the, um, in the chat that uh, if you want to um, help test your new reporting platform, um, that there's a, um, a place you can go to volunteer for that. And given that you've got a very interested group of, of small businesses here, you may get quite a few people putting their hands up. So I just wanted to make sure everyone had seen that. Yeah, if you want to jump to the next slide, I can, I can jump into that a little bit as well. Fantastic. Um, yeah, so we're building the National Cybercrime and Fraud Reporting System, uh, our minimum viable product launched in March 2020. And we've been diverting a few reports from the CAFC reporting system through the NCFRS to help build it. Um, we're building it iteratively and we're trying to build a system that makes it easy to report. We recognize that reporting can be sometimes complicated. There's many places to report. It can be cumbersome. Sometimes, you know, you've had one of the worst days uh, in, in your business and it's, you know, reporting might be the last thing that you're thinking of. So we're trying to make it as easy as possible for a victim to report. Um, and we have a big, big focus on the user experience and user research to make the reporting process streamlined and simple. So if you have any interest in being a part of that, um, please reach out. We're always looking for businesses to, to help us out on that front. And you won't just be helping us out. You'll be helping out every other business that's looking to report. We can hop to the next slide. Actually, I'm gonna um, I'm, I'm gonna just ask you a couple more questions before you sure. go on because there are a couple I want to make sure we get to because I think there was one about oh Mike was asking how secure are online online cloud systems, um, you know, what are the what are the risks and and do those cloud platforms get taken down for ransom? So. I, I haven't had any personal experience with the cloud platforms, but I think the la the thing to to remind yourself is that there's there's going to be vulnerabilities in all platforms um, because they're actively searching for these. Um, and then I think Gina mentioned the the most important piece is that the actual platform you use, yes, it's important. Um, the the benefit of cloud platforms is typically you'll have backups, and potentially those backups can be protected, especially if you have an offline version of those cloud backups. Um, but the big piece is that ultimately it's a human problem. And if there's human error in configuring these cloud platforms, if there's human error in monitoring the activity on these cloud platforms, they're just as vulnerable as any other platform. So in terms of security best practices, you know, as far as I'm aware, yes, cloud platforms are a great option. Um, they're especially useful for businesses that have a distributed workforce and, and, uh, and need access from all over, the, all over Canada, all over the world, whatnot. 
Um, but at the end of the day, you need to make sure that the human elements are in line in order for that, for that security to pan out for you. Jason, did you have anything to add to that or is that? No, no uh, well put. This is the, the actual services of clouds a little bit out of my technical capability. So. Yeah, yeah, I know it gets very specialized, doesn't it? Um, one other one I want to make sure we hit before the end of the webinar, so I'm going to put it to you now, is um, I'm sure a lot of members are asking the same question as Yoki, which is aside from recovering valid backups, like what can businesses do if they don't pay? Like, I, I think a lot of businesses don't want to pay, um, but what can they do to put themselves in a position where they can get back up and running and not pay um, for um, for for what's happened? So it's uh it's really tough because it's case by case, I think. It really depends on what kind of ransomware it is, what the level of sophistication is. If there's a decryptor out there for that ransomware, how sophisticated is the encryption? Um, there's lots of, uh, like no more ransom, for example, they have a bank of decryptors that you can go visit and see if there's a decryptor for the particular type of ransomware that's hit you. Um, and so there's, uh, there are other opportunities. You can work with a third party recovery firm to see if they can decrypt your data. Um, but if they've gone in there and they've used a strong encryption algorithm, it's really challenging to get your data back. Um, and that's why, you know, sometimes there is no option but to pay. And we recognize that businesses sometimes need to make that choice. Um, what I want to underscore there is even if you do pay, that doesn't mean that law enforcement doesn't want to hear from you. That doesn't mean that law enforcement doesn't want to help you. We're not going to make you feel bad for paying. We recognize every business has their own decisions to make. Um, and we are, we are here to help, whether you've paid, whether you've not paid, whether you're thinking about paying or anything in between. I know we had a, a, um, a member of ours um, in the dry cleaning business who got hit and he had a um, he had a, a backup, a separate backup, and that allowed him to not pay and get back. And, you know, obviously he alerted his customers and, you know, there was a bit of a, you know, there was a bit of a, a process there and it was definitely a headache. Um, but he said having that backup uh, data was just um, invaluable for um, for uh, for this particular situation. Definitely. And that's one of the best practices, right, is not only to have one backup, but it's to have offline backups, to have online backups, to have backups that are on separate networks um, so that if somebody gets into one system or one network, you have an opportunity to back it up from somewhere else. Great. And I just noticed that Jocelyn has put in the chat the No More Ransom link to um, that site for everybody. So, um, so you know where to go um, to contact them. And I, and I just saw I, a comment. Sorry, I just saw a comment from Brenda to test your backups. And I think I want to piggyback on that. Not only test your backups, but test all your recovery processes, test your incident response. Um, I think that if the first time you're, you're doing your incident response is when an incident happens, uh, you're going to find it a lot more painful uh, than if you do some test runs, you know, tabletop exercises, whether it's, you know, just walking through the motions with your team or, or whether you, you yourself are the team going over it yourself. Um, you know, I think it's, it's really important because the more practice you get, the more prepared you're going to be for when it actually happens. Yeah. Great. Okay. We've hit some questions and we're, our, our, our runway is always too short for these webinars. I'm going to let you fly through some, some um, slides and then I'm going to hope to hit another couple of questions. If yeah, we just think, go back to the last slide. We could probably hit up. I'm looking at those questions. I think a couple will be answered here in these last slide or two. Can we just go back one slide just to talk about what uh, what police will do? Yeah, this one. Thank you. Um, so we've asked you to report. You've reported to police. Now what? So the biggest challenge that I've, I've sort of iterated is that cybercrime is borderless. Um, perpetrators can be located across the planet. Um, and one of the biggest challenges is finding out who done it. And that in cybercrime, we call that attribution. And although prosecution and arrests are the ultimate goal, so that's apprehension on the bottom here, apprehending those who enable, support, or commit the offenses in Canada and abroad, um, it's not the only possible outcome. The other, there are other key lanes of effort, and we talked about them in, with relation to Hive earlier, and those are prevention, which is what we are doing today. We are talking to you guys, trying to make sure that there's awareness about this, this issue so that you can educate yourselves and better protect yourselves. That includes, you know, citizens, that includes businesses, that includes industry. Um, and hopefully by doing that prevention, uh, you guys are, are, are better protected. 
Um, but there, we also do uh, timely victim notifications. When we hear about people being victimized, we'll notify that they're in the process of being victimized. You know, we share information all across all across the world with folks like Jason at HSI, with Euro, with Europol um, and others who have ongoing operations against all kinds of, of cyber criminals. Um, and we try to we try to help you where we can, um, that which includes preemptive sort of help in some cases. We share known techniques, known tactics and procedures used by cyber criminals. Um, and then finally, the middle one here is, is we try to disrupt them when we can. So when the criminal investigation might come to a halt and there's a cyber criminal in a jurisdiction that we can't reach, um, we will try to disrupt them. And we allow law enforcement, or law, it allows law enforcement to disrupt the underlying criminal infrastructure, the underlying markets, uh, the payment systems that all enable cyber criminals to commit their offenses. And we will work with other partners, including law enforcement, but also the private sector to do this because sometimes, you know, we have to work with an internet service provider or a telephone company or a hosting service to take down, to take down a, um, a website. And so we wanna work with all those folks to make it as difficult as possible to, to conduct cyber crime. You know, and there, there's a good thing to take from this slide for you guys there in the audience is, yeah, that's what we're doing in law enforcement on each side of the border and worldwide. But what can you do as a small business owner? You could do prevention. You could talk to your employees. You can have quarterly meetings on cybersecurity. Uh, you can make sure that your uh, updates, as Gina talked about from MasterCard, that's kind of probably the number one thing that's going to prevent malicious attacks is updating your software and making sure that those common vulnerability exposures aren't exposed on your network. And you guys can do disruption. So if you're doing um, reviews of your logs, or if one of your employees is telling you that, hey, there's this like pop up on the point of sale system, you guys can review your network, uh, whether it's through a managed service or through a local CISO, and find those rogue IPs that aren't usually in there and kick them out and then go ahead and update everybody's passwords. If you've got an employee who's recently been fired, make sure you get all their access taken away as well. So you don't have any insider threat. And you guys can't put the handcuffs on them, but you can apprehend these criminals by reporting it to us in law enforcement. So that's kind of, you know, looking at this slide, um, you guys are on the front lines. We're the ones always kind of following up with cybercrime. So kind of take this slide and, and figure out what you guys can do for prevention disruption and, and ultimately help us apprehend these criminals. Jason, why don't you take it away here? Being yeah, thanks. Liaison. So we uh been driving the point home of reporting and how we work together. And I think there were a couple uh, questions. Uh, Rick asked about conviction rates. That's the end product of things. I think the more important thing is disruption. And that's us sharing information between our countries and beyond. Uh, if we're working an investigation in the United States and because of an incident response, we find IOCs that point to a potential victim in say Toronto, we will contact the NC3 Currently, we have an embedded HSI cyber intrusion agent who sits over at the NC3 in Ottawa for the next four months, and we hope to have somebody there full time. We deconflict and share information with the FBI and the Secret Service in the United States and here at the embassy in Ottawa and our consulates. And we work on trainings with each other as well. So I've attended some trainings put on by the RCMP since I've been in country. I put on training for cryptocurrency and dark web, and a lot of our agents collaborate with our Canadian counterparts. Um, somebody asked about the uh, no jurisdiction. That's not something we look at. This slide shows that there is jurisdiction. We've got uh, the NCFTA, which is the National Cyber Forensics Training Alliance. There's an RCMP member that sits there in New York, and we've got two agents at the Pittsburgh location. They do analysis mm -hmm. on malware go as well. So they're, they're good to, to work with. That's why we all work together, because the whole no jurisdiction thing goes out the window. We can take all these information and share it. The RCMP has liaison officers internationally, and we have about 90 offices in 53 countries as well. Sorry, it took a second to find the mute button there. Um, <laughs> So now it's a large problem and, and what do we do? So we work with police agencies, private sector entities, internationally, federally, provincially, municipally, with other government partners. Um, and so we, we work to develop relationships in all sectors. And that's why, that's why we're here, right? We wanna make sure that 
you understand that we exist, that you're, we, are, we have a point of contact for you, that we're here to help. Um, and we understand that it's a team sport. So we know that we need to build partnerships on every level. The beauty of the NC3 uh, being a national police service is that we're not we're not limited to working only with the federal police so the RCMP we can work with any police agency anywhere across the country and as Jason said we have uh, we have uh, liaison officers in San Francisco right now we have a liaison officer at the NCFD in Pittsburgh we have a liaison officer at Europol where there's I think 18 or 19 countries in Europe um, we also have an intelligence analyst over there. So we're actively building our global presence to be able to combat this, this jurisdictional issue. And on the bottom here, you'll see your role. And I think that's, that's the biggest thing that we wanna underscore here in this presentation is that you have a role to play in, in fighting this battle because it's cross-jurisdictional, because it affects everybody. Your reporting, your engagement with police, your engagement with cybersecurity training like that provided here through CFIB, um, and staying on top of all this stuff, although it can be overwhelming, you know, even just putting, doing your level best and putting some effort into this will go a long way because we've also found that cyber criminals, they are looking for the easiest dollar. So if you put an ounce of prevention, they will, on, they will move on in all honesty. In, in most cases, unless they're specifically targeting you, they will move on. They're looking for those who are not doing any protection because they still exist. They use existing vulnerabilities from years and years and years ago for folks who haven't patched their system. They used username and passwords that have been leaked years and years and years ago. I, I don't know if you guys remember um, Desjardins got breached a long time ago. We're still seeing credentials from that Desjardins breach being used um, to, to commit frauds and, and other cyber crimes. You know, this, they're using the easiest way possible. And if you make it a little bit harder from, for them, you will do, uh, you will be helping your business out massively and making yourself a much smaller target than it otherwise would be. Yeah, and I, and I think one of the questions that popped in here is, you know, in a small business, you got a lot of employees and they may have the computer skills. Some people refuse to, you know, change their passwords. So just putting in those rules within your small business and kind of having that cybersecurity outreach to let them know that it's just better to do it, make a larger password. Two-factor authentication is great. I like to relate network protection to your home. And I think it does hit home to people. A lot of people buy security cameras and ring doorbells after a break-in. So when you're looking at your network protection, it's really easy to not do the forward-leaning, proactive and preventative things that Idan was just talking about and Gina with MasterCard why wait for something bad to happen? Go ahead and update people's passwords, make a one pager that you hand out. Uh, even at some government facilities that I've worked at, there's a little flyer from our IT department, just reminder, don't plug your iPhone into your computer. And then immediately they'll see that um, kind of uh, use decrease. So really awareness is, is just number one, it's key. And it involves no technical capability at all. That's a great, uh, Jason, that's a great a note to, to end on. And I think a um, couple of other things, we've got the Cybersecurity uh, Academy. Um, here's some links on um, for more information uh, here, but um, also you're giving me a great idea. I think Jocelyn and I will talk about a tool that we might be able to create for businesses that are some of those tips just to make it easy for um, small businesses so busy just running their business. <laughs> it's like a, a quick um, tip sheet. Um, can be really helpful. And maybe that's something we can work with you guys on and, and get that to members. Jocelyn, um, we're going to fly through just really quickly um, some of this. Um, just we did get some questions on insurance. So do you want to just in 10 seconds give the insurance Absolutely. plug? I, yeah, I just wanted to let everyone know that in your uh, member portal, there is a cybersecurity prep list for insurance. This is a list of questions to answer before you call an insurance company. Um, insurance for your cyber is complex and you need to know what you need before you make that call out. So please download that checklist. I do want to give a shout out as well to Northridge Insurance who offer a partnership, an exclusive member partnership. Um, they, If you are their customer and a member, they offer free cyber coverage. Um, we do have an opportunity to work with the Insurance Bureau of Canada and Northridge a little later in this year, so they may join us on a webinar. Um, but again, find these templates in your portal. 
And then we have some upcoming webinars that you wanted to mention, Laura. Yeah, so we've got a couple of upcoming ones. And now uh, you mentioned another one we're thinking about doing, which is one on cyber insurance um, to, to kind of fill out this series. I'm also seeing quite a few people saying they love the idea of a tip sheet. So um, looks like we may have some more work to do with Edan and, and, and Jason uh, coming up. But we've got um, the contest closes for the Cyber Academy. Um, that's a great thing to use with your employees as well. Okay, that's like quick, easy, um, and there are some incentives there. Um, we're also looking at doing a federal budget overview um, following the, the, the budget and then another economic outlook with our chief economist. Um, and he did one at the beginning of the year that was very well received by members. So he's great. Um, and he's like he's like the chief economist for small business. So he's he's really uh, cool. Um, quick question from Franca on how long are each of the courses in the academy? I think some of them are less than five minutes. It's like we really tried to make them bite size. Right, Jocelyn? seven minutes yes absolutely yeah. so like and they're broken out into different topics so you don't have to do it all at once and i think with that we've kind of um i've skated a little over time i really appreciate everyone's um uh patience i know there are more questions don't worry we're going to do more on this topic we're going to use your questions as we always do to come up with good tips to come up with good web content um, for you and we're going to keep uh, this series going um, i'll just invite the the panelists um, to say a few really quick final words because we have skated a little over time jocelyn do you want to start I'm just going to reiterate, if you can do anything today, please download the Cybersecurity Incident Response Plan. It is a big template. It's almost 12 pages. It's almost a workbook, but it's going to help you walk through um, and prepare you for those incidents that inevitably might happen to your business. Yeah, so think about it. Plan in advance and before the door gets kicked in, right, Jason? I'll turn it to you next, Jason, for a, for a, a, a final word. No, just thank you guys at the CFIB, the RCMP, MasterCard. Um, you know, part of policing is is getting out there and preventing crime. So it, it's really not about the people we arrest or what we seize. If we can prevent criminals from getting access to networks and then monetizing your data, your trade secrets, then uh, I, I think that's that's the biggest point to take from this. So I just I had a great time. Appreciate the invite. Yeah, thanks. Um, yeah, you and Edan did a fantastic job. Uh, Edan and then uh, Gina, I'll give you a just a, a final word here. Given we're over so time. Thank you. Oh, sorry. Thank Go you ahead, Gina. Go ahead. <laughs> thank you for including a, a MasterCard, myself, in this presentation. I learned so much from Jason and Edan, Edan, and I look forward to learning more. Thank you. You're getting a lot of thank yous from uh, from the members who participated as well. Um, Edan, while you uh, give your final thoughts and then I'll just wrap us up. Yeah, I just wanna say a big thanks for all of you guys taking the time out to listen. Um, I know you're all extremely busy running your various businesses and I think it's important that, that you guys took the time and saw the importance in this. Um, there were a ton of questions. So I'll, I'll let you, know, you folks know and, and Laura and team, uh, no, we're happy to answer them offline after the fact. Uh, so just please reach out and we'll, we'll, we'll try our best to answer every question that we can. Thanks. Well, I just want to say a huge thank you again. It's, um, it, you know, this is a very fluid space is one of the takeaways for me that when you, you know, just how much more sophisticated the criminals are getting um, is changing, how uh, how policing and reporting uh, is working is changing. Um, and so, um, and we all have to kind of do our best to keep up with it. I remember um, about, I mean, well, it was some years ago, but two-factor authentication was seen as kind of cumbersome and, uh, a pro you know, a problem. And now we all kind of get it. Like we get why that's a protection. So very fluid space, great information. Um, for those of you, again, we'll be sending the webinar decks um, for, uh, for this one and also the webinar links for this one and the cybersecurity one. Uh, yes, your employees can take the cyber. I'm answering a few more, sneaking in a few more answers. And the template Jocelyn talked about, there was a last question um, there about that. That one we're not sending. You actually need to sign into your, um, with your member login. And that's Jocelyn at uh, cfib.ca backslash slash login 
is where you go and that then will be featured fairly prominently I think on the um, when you go into the member tools it will be there and you'll find that uh, workbook uh, that you're talking about to plan for an, an incident so that you can um, have that on on hand listen just a huge thank you um, to everyone and uh, for participating in another great uh, webinar and we look forward to hopefully seeing you again soon on another one and thanks for your patience as we skated a little over time Thanks, everyone.